use of force from international relations would be working. Uh, this Ukrainian situation is a very significant geopolitical situation. And here in Miami, the closest place to watch is Venezuela. Uh, uh, it's no uh, uh, secret that the Russian Foreign Minister, uh, Minister of Defense not long time ago visited Cuba, and, he, uh, and there is a um, uh, Russian military intelligence uh, 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 vessel uh, uh, in uh, the port of Havana in these days, and that uh, the Russian uh, intention to project their power not only in the region but globally is uh, very uh, clear and articul uh, uh, articulate. No one can have uh, doubts about that. Uh, what was mentioned also here that one of the clearest Russian intentions was to get uh, to secure the port of Sevastopol, the Black Sea. But uh, if we take this into consideration, so let's go for and look at Monroe Convention, 1936, that has given uh, to Turkey uh, the right to control the narrowest straits uh, that are used uh, for uh, uh, naval navigation and for the passage of military uh, 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 military vessels uh, through from Black Sea to Mediterranean and through Straits of Gibraltar to the system of world oceans. So we will have another uh, interesting discussion here uh, to do. We are asking what is the Central European reaction uh, or Czech reaction or reaction of other states uh, to this situation. Obviously, uh, as been said many times in our press recently, it's a kind of wake-up call. It's a wake-up call that the world is not going to be as safe place as it used to be. Uh, we need to be very realistic. Uh, it doesn't make much sense just to demonize Putin and his people. But his, uh, he laid out his intentions uh, in a very open way. Uh, and it's really interesting to see what NATO, what the European Union, what the United States, and also other partners are going to do. There is a big, big theme, uh, the uh, uh, reaction of the markets, the reaction of the financial uh, world, because still the major stabilizers are with the Western institutions. If Brazil, China, India decides to go along with this Russian uh, way to, uh, of doing things, we will see really the world going in a very dangerous direction. But I don't think it's going to happen. Thank you. very enlightening and, uh, and very, very interesting. My question is for Dr. Thiel. Uh, do you think this crisis will influence energies, the energy policies in Germany? That's actually it. Thank you very much. Should I answer that again? Yeah. yeah, why don't we try? Okay. Thanks, Therese. That's a very good question. Actually, something I wanted to mention, but I forgot um, when I was talking about this. Yes, I definitely think um, that has led to a wake-up call for the German energy policy. Um, you may know or not, um, and you know, you're from Norway, right? So um, you have plenty of energy, <laughs> including oil and gas. Um, and so we actually have, we trade, we get a lot of, about 30, 27 to 30 percent of our oil and gas needs come from Russia in Germany, right? But um, I read actually that Norway, we, Norway actually supplies more gas and oil already to us. So that's a good thing in that sense. But um, our energy prices, um, by kilowatt hours I mean, are the highest in Europe and so even before the crisis um, the high price of energy for a, you know sort of a manufacturing country like Germany is it was a big domestic problem of course with the Ukrainian crisis that has be that problem has become even bigger so that has led to a domestic rethinking and you may know also that Germany after the Fukushima incidents in 2011 decided to phase out conventional uh, energy sources um, however Renewables cannot get us the energy needs, so cannot meet the energy needs that we need and have in Germany. So Germany has to really now fundamentally rethink what to do, but 
do that in a very quick manner because Putin may act quicker, right, in cutting off the gas than the Germans can reorient their energy policy. So I see that as a problem, but it's a very good point. Um, we were talking about intent, more intense cooperation in with Norway, right, to give us even more oil and gas. Um, the shale gas energy, which has been so popular here in the U.S., that there was an attempt initially a year ago to also start shale gas production in Poland and Germany and so on. Then it was found out that there's this whole tricky fracking issue and you know um, earthquakes and so on. That shale gas will become now more popular. And the EU has actually stopped as of last week and their energy policy, the 2030 energy policy, to again fundamentally rethink their energy dependence on Russian gas and oil. Thank you. So, Mr. Marcus, to what point do you think that the invasion of the or the escalation of the violence has to escalate in order for the UA, the EU to make um, a more heavy intervention? And how do you think that since the, uh, Russia is part of the UN Security Council, how is the UN looking into that? I mean, would they do anything about it? Would they just watch, just like the EU, EU is watching? Yeah. Well, yeah. Is it for me? Yeah, for both of you. Oh, the first one is for you. Okay, uh, look, uh, obviously, yeah, yeah. I teach here uh, among others the class understanding graduations, and the question is effectivity of the system. And here, uh, you, uh, you make a point uh, uh, Russian Federation uh, belongs to P5, five permanent members of the Security Council. They are entrusted with primary, more than primary responsibility for uh, international peace and security. And if one of these members now is using uh, its veto power uh, to uh, justify uh, its own annexations, uh, and uh, it, it is, uh, it's really a very, very saddening signal, and it still remains to be seen how the Security Council can absorb uh, this shock. Uh, Minister Lavrov already uh, indicated, actually, it was Vitaly Chukin, a uh, uh, Russian parliament representative, he had a fight recently with some of the powers, the U.S. Uh, partner. And uh, he even wanted to remind her that as uh, long as the Russians would be reminded of uh, that, uh, their willingness to cooperate in other issues uh, would uh, be uh, maybe uh, uh, decreasing. Uh, and obviously what he meant was Syria, and it might be Iran, and other things. Uh, other things. Uh, we know that League of Nations uh, also collapsed uh, under uh, uh, being exposed to brutal force, uh, and uh, hopefully it's not going to happen, but it can happen to the UN system too. Yeah, to add to that, yeah, exactly. So in that sense, I mean, think the UN will, uh, Security Council will always be blocked by Russia, and therefore there's a matter of um, irrelevance attached to that those attempts. With regards to the EU, the EU, and you know Germany is watching very carefully what happens now in the next next couple of weeks, right, with regards to anything that happens in, in Ukraine. Um, there is, the, they will gradually list, um, expand the list of sanctions on individuals, on high net worth individuals across Europe. They have drawn already a list of 100 high net worth bankers, oligarchs, financiers um, that have assets in Europe. So they can expand that first and then there will stepwise be a sanction, you know, uh, asset freezes on Russian, any Russian assets, banks in Europe, and there are plenty of them by now in London and in Cyprus. Um, and following uh, that, I think also they, uh, there's a proactive, you see a proactive approach by the European Union. They have just started to sign that um, association agreement with Ukraine a couple of days ago. Um, that Yanukovych, you know, the former president, yeah, the, yeah, he's exactly, only the preamble, they only signed the preamble of that. In fact, the 25, 21 pages out of a 1,500 document, the 2% that they signed, but this was a symbolic step to show the Ukraine we are, we want to have an association with you, right? Not membership, but an association. The other parts of the agreement may be implemented um, after the elections in the Ukraine, because they don't want to antagonize the Russians. Uh, just one sentence, uh, so just to you understand what association agreement is. It is uh, uh, maybe uh, the first uh, statement of willingness, political statement to do that, and then the rest of it is a very detailed uh, uh, list and catalogs of what this association means in terms of accessibility to uh, the European market and uh, the condition of European goods in, in uh, uh, the uh, Ukrainian market. We had to go, to go through the same thing. And it's really, uh, uh, this is a, 
almost catalog of uh, all goods you can uh, think about. What would you say about the, when the U.S. NATO invaded Iran and Iraq? They bombarded Libya, so they went to another country to do what they wanted to do. And also, what do you think about the West, you know, Europe, the U.S., basically provoking Russia, because it's not the big power it used to be, by trying to add some of the Soviet countries, you know, Latvia to the NATO allegiance? Um, don't you think it's a provocation by the West trying to add Russia? And that's about it. Okay, look, uh, this will be a really long debate very shortly. I have, no, I have no intention to be, I would say, advocate of everything what the United States or whoever has done. But uh, uh, at least uh, to say that the United States has not annexed an inch of territory of uh, Iraq or, or, or of any uh, other country. and the. Uh, situation that leading to uh, this uh, 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 2003 uh, decision uh, was uh, 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 th there was a big they had a, a very big, uh, substantive discussion before the famous resolution of the Security Council with uh, serious consequences and so on and so forth. So uh, I think I'm afraid that we are comparing things that cannot be so easily compared. Uh, don't uh, misunderstand me. I'm really not advocating uh, everything what the West does. But uh, one of the unpleasant consequences of your position is that you would say, okay, they did it, we can do it too, or they can do it too, so then the world would be changed into a real uh, field of anarchical struggle of all against all, maybe a clash of civilizations. And you mentioned Estonia. Estonia is a tiny country with a really uh, bloody experience uh, throughout the 20th century. And I think that they, this decision was based on the free... Uh, a decision of uh, Estonia uh, to belong to this organization. And with all due respect to Russian interests, I don't think that uh, Russian interests should block uh, the decisions made by small countries. Small countries are also uh, countries that need to be uh, yeah, given certain uh, respect and recognition. speak a little bit to what actually brought them together as, as one body, maybe what uh, at least unifies what unifies them to, to a certain degree. Unifies them now? Yes. After 1991, when um, there was a transition towards democracy, you know, that um, former Soviet Republic started declaring independence, um, they started um, big identity building, and if we look, apply social constructivist perspective, you know that identities are not set in stone and fluid, and the smart politician will start creating a new Ukrainian identity, and that's what uh, Professor Kramer's uh, maps actually demonstrated, where people might speak Russian, but they no longer identify themselves with ethnic Russia they actually identify themselves with Ukrainian, and that's what uh, brought them together. And that what Ukrainian did, very different from Belarus, for instance, they never kept the Russian language as the official language. They only declared Ukrainian. But what also they did, uh, contrast to uh, Latvia and Estonia, they never outlawed the 20% um, percent of the Russian population, so they kept inclusivity. So the 20% of Russians who are now um, forced, I don't want to use the word forced, but now they have to learn Ukrainian language. And you know that once we learn language, we learn history, we learn um, mentality. And that's what keeps them together now. And just you know, my final remark, I guess, it's very sad to see what's happening because it's really, they're the brink of, um, one brother killing another brother, and that's scary. Yes, um, I, first I just want to say thank you for the very interesting discussion. My question is, what 
to anybody on the panel who can answer, what do you, what, what do you think of the Western slash European decision to essentially blacklist Russia um, after the whole situation happened? Um, particularly what we see happening, what happened yesterday, they expelled Russia out of the G8. Um, so my question is, do you think that's the proper way to deal with the situation? Or, or should they try to be more diplomatic and try to be a little bit more open to talks with either Putin or, um, you know, the Russian government? Only because um, no one has really presented anything of Russia's perspective. I just wanted to say um, something unpopular in this room, I think. Um, this is really a deep failure of Western foreign policy, how we've gotten to this point. Um, it was, if you watched the response of Russia to these increasing movements within Ukraine, the developments in Maidan Square and all of these things, you could see what, where this was going, and the West was blind to this, or at least they pretended they were, or maybe they thought they could pretend they were and get away with it. But when the agreement was made under the, um, I guess, mediation of the Russians a couple of days before the final assault, which led to the fleeing of Yanukovych, um, we could have had, there was a sign that Russia was, in, Russia was involved, and Russia was committed then to participating in a solution. When you cut Russia out, what you do is make it an adversary, and then Putin has no other response. I'm not saying he's justified in any way under international law, but in terms of his response, he's helpless other than to do the kinds of things he's been doing. So um, the West um, isn't at fault for this, but the West is very, very inept in foreign policy um, and failure to recognize.